Hey guys, it's May from Markets with May, and in this episode, we're going to revisit why I'm short Upstart. Now, on December 14th, I did a full video going through the financials of Upstart, and I told you that I couldn't find any kind of tangible reason to go long this company. And subsequent to that, the stock has been down around 21%. That I've watched more than one analyst come out supporting the stock, suggesting that since it's down 91%, that that's a good reason why you should be uh, long the stock or consider it for investment. Now, momentum traders may be in and out of this stock in the next week before the banks start reporting earnings. But I will say that if you are not an expert level day trader, you want to stay out of this. Because one thing's for sure, the subprime market did not open up in the month of December. Now, if you're completely new to this, then I would definitely watch my video that covers the earnings season this last quarter. I'll put a link in the show notes and I'll also put it at the end of this show. But in this video, I'm primarily going to cover a little bit more intensely the bear thesis. And in particular, I'm going to address this Motley Fool article, which I think is very brave, but definitely has some issues in it. It's called Everyone's Down on Upstart Stock. Here's why I love it. But before we get into that, here are the disclosures. Past performance is not indicative of future returns. This is not investment advice. It's for education purposes only. And I do have a short position in Upstart structured as put spreads. Finally, a shout out to Grula.app. Money goes where it's treated best. And there's information in my show notes if you want to learn more about them. Now, let's talk about why I'm short Upstart. Now, one of the truly annoying things that the bulls will say about Upstart when they're talking about it is that this company is a loan originator. I got news for you. It stopped being a loan originator two quarters ago when it started to have more loans on balance sheet than most hedge fund managers acquire over the course of five years in business. Let's be crystal clear. You got a billion dollars worth of loans that you haven't been able to move off of balance sheet. And on the cash flow statement, it shows even worse because you're hiding it as loans held for sale. So you're well over a billion there. That makes you a credit asset manager. And then it just becomes a question of what kind of credit asset manager are you? Now let's break that down a little bit because I think there's a lot of confusion on this. What's it mean to be a loan originator? To be a loan originator means that you originate the loan and you don't have loans on your balance sheet. As soon as you have a massive amount of loans on the balance sheet, you take on credit risk. And I need to start asking you a totally different set of questions, which incidentally, you're not giving me any data on currently. Now, some bullish analyst is still going to try to argue with me and say, how can you say that most of the revenue is still coming from feed revenue and good try. Because if you'll take a look at the next line item, you'll see a big fat L coming from fair market value adjustments and interest income. That tells me that whatever it was that you received in interest income wasn't enough to make up and compensate for the fact that that book of loans is actually declining in value. And on top of it, you've marked it, but you didn't mark it down enough to get it off the books. Now, even after that, some of you might still want to argue with me, but I would have you have a little look at the cash flow statement at those loans held for sale. And you can compare it from the second quarter to the third quarter, and you'll see that that number just keeps going up. That's also bad. And that only happens if you have transitioned from becoming a mortgage originator to an asset manager of a loan portfolio. But we're going to get into why being an asset manager of a loan portfolio is a problem. But before we do that, I want to address point one of this article. And, you know, for the record, I actually think this is one of the better written bull cases that I saw. Nonetheless, this argument that Upstart still has partner support is the wrong argument if this is what's going on with your loan book. Here's the deal. What it means is that they're actually still placed in the software with a bunch of different people. And you got a couple of nuances there. First, it's still the case that most of the loans are coming from one bank. Regardless of the new users, Cross River Bank is still originating more than 50% of the loans. That tells me, put as much software as you want out there, most of your origination risk is coming from one single source. Now the section then tries to say, well, on account basis, there were 31 banks and credit units they were working with, and now it's up to 83. But let me just make it really crystal clear. You have a billion dollars on the books that you're now responsible for. You don't need to be originating any more loans until you can move that off balance sheet. Now let's talk about why it's such a problem for Upstart to be the asset manager of a loan portfolio. 
Well, let's start with where I left off on the last video. Now, this is the executive management team and the board of directors. And while all of them are massively successful, super smart people, not a one of them has any meaningful background in credit risk management, debt capital markets, uh, debt asset management. Now, you could say that from 2013 to 2022, all of them have been doing this business, but you know what? That doesn't cover any kind of meaningful real problem in the subprime market. Now, even that could be less of a problem, except that if you actually look through this financial statement, it really looks like a high tech company that has really ramped up its costs to build out what it believes will one day be a scalable loan origination company attached to a loan portfolio. And this cost structure just doesn't make sense for what's going on. This cost structure only makes sense if they're gonna amp up the number of loans dramatically, but since they can't offload them, that would be the most dangerous thing to do right now. And that takes me to point two of the Motley Fool article, which is the financials remain solid. And the argument they use is the balance sheet because current assets are enough to service current liabilities. But honey, I'm gonna tell you now, if this is actually a loan portfolio, you don't look at the balance sheet that way. You look at book value and figure out if there's a massive impairment. And we don't actually have the statistics we need from this company to make any kind of reasonable assessment. And we know that it's not zero impairment, because otherwise those loans would come off the balance sheet. Now let's talk about the risk metrics we'd actually need that we didn't get from management on the last quarter. Now, possibly in the next quarter they could give it to us. I know that they have the capability to do so because actually one of the metrics was given in the second quarter, but not in the third quarter. Now, management gave this beautiful chart of how they do a five-tiered FICO score relative to others' three-tiered FICO score, and that's wonderful and everything, but I actually need to see the percentages to understand what the nature of the billion dollars you have on your book actually is. Now, in the second quarter, Upstart provided this document called Update on Upstart's Credit Performance and Funding Model. And that document reads the following sentence, our credit performance remains solid. If an investor invested equally in all upstart cohorts, they would now expect a 9.8% gross annualized returns. Well, you can actually use that number to get a sense for what's going on with these loans. What type of loans are they? So here is the most recent average auto loan interest rate by credit score from Experion. And if you look at this chart and subtract the 100 basis points that interest rates have risen in the last year just to kind of get it to what it might have looked like uh, in August, you would see that the category of loans that they're writing is non-prime, 620 to 659 credit score. So 9.33% is just below the 9.89%. Hence, it's very hard to understand the nature of this credit portfolio. But at a minimum, if we give them full credit, we would say that it was non-prime. However, my concern is that they were able to get the prime and super prime components off of the balance sheet. And so what we're really looking at is a subprime auto lending book. Now they did tell us on the quarter that the loan loss rates are only up a little bit um, in line with historical averages. And that's great and everything. The only challenge is, is that we know your loans are young and vintage, meaning you didn't have these loans last year. Now you got the loans on the book. So these loans are one year old. But because your loan book uh, increased from about 140 million to almost 800 million, a billion dollars on the year, depending on how you're looking at it exactly, I need a lot more detail than just this little graph. And I'm gonna tell you why. The majority of your loans are still coming from the second part of the year. So how do I actually think about the nature of this number relative to the books on your specific balance sheet. Now I talked about this very briefly in the last video I did because I didn't want to overmath people, but let's talk about the Poisson distribution a little bit more thoroughly. See, in a Poisson distribution, what happens is you got a bunch of losses up front that are just origination, poor writing is what it is. And then the losses taper, you don't have very many losses and you're off into the races with a very low loss rate that is more than baked in by the interest payments that you're receiving. However, it, the math on it is this thing called lambda, that hazard rate. And that hazard rate changes dramatically if we start to see frequency of loss increase dramatically in a short period of time. And so in a lot of ways, that is why a bank is giving you 
30, 60, and 90 day buckets of people that are just late on their payments so that you as the analyst can understand more cleanly what that loan loss ratio actually is. Like, is it increasing frequency up front? Did we just start to see a bunch and we shouldn't have seen that? That sort of thing. Now, the reason you care is not just mathematical between these 30, 60, and 90 days. You're trying to figure out if there's a correlation of people not being able to pay their bills. If you're just swimming along, everything's great, and then suddenly one month, a bunch of people fail to pay their auto loan, and then the next month, still, those people didn't come up with some cash for you, and then it goes to the 90-day period, now you have a very different type of loan situation going on, and those loans are hard to sell off. Now, the banks definitely do this analysis on the regular, and they'll provide it in their 10K. They'll say immediately, look at what we're seeing in each of these 30, 60, 90 days. You can see very clearly what's going on. Upstart technically is an originator, so they're not accustomed to providing this data. I didn't see it in any of the other notes. Makes sense to me if before you had almost no loans, and now you got a billion and change loans on the balance sheet. Now, the other thing that is incorporated in this Lambda is the repossession rate, the repo rate of the actual asset. And in this case, we've got more than 50% of the loans that are automobile loans. Now, it turns out all that gobbledygook means this. The price that I can resell the car at if I have to repossess it actually matters for the calculation of this math, that Lambda. And if used car prices were going up, I would feel great about what was going on and that we had a little bit of cushion here with Upstart. But unfortunately, used car prices have been going down, as we can see from the last CPI number that came out recently. We also know fire selling inventory to shore up capital on the balance sheet. That would be both my video on Carvana, which you can take a look at, and also CarMax recently indicated that they were doing that as well. Now they do provide this chart that is scenario sensitivity analysis as relates to uh, 100 basis point move in interest rates, which has happened. So that's gonna be at least the 8.4 uh, billion that they're indicating off the 700 million. And then there's the expected credit loss rates on underlying loans, which they're saying if there's a 10% adverse change, uh, then you've got 8.6 billion. And if there's a 20% adverse change, that's 17 billion. But what's all that gobbledygook actually mean so that you can know that it's right? It really requires that you have a sense for the credit risk that they took and how much the market by itself, even beyond whether or not they wrote good loans or not, what the market is gonna pay right this minute for something that is investment grade versus whatever it is they wrote. And I don't have the data I need to really feel comfortable about that. Now, if you add the worst case scenarios that they're putting on here together, you get about 30 million or a 5% impairment. But the problem is this is kind of a held to maturity, assuming each year sort of scenario analysis. This is not what is the repricing of the loans given that the market is now paying less for your debt kind of scenario. None of it is really tested through a truly weak credit market, particularly in subprime. And the real issue here is because if we learn nothing else in 2008, we learned that things that look a certain way on the models can actually be significantly more correlated, particularly in the subprime space. And I still don't know what this loan book is. Hence, even with this scenario analysis, it would be very difficult to feel confident that you could correctly assess what's going on with the book and what economic variables would impact it correctly. So now let's go to the last bullet point of this article, which is the stock is priced for failure. And it says the declining stock price is normal in a broadly sinking market, but down 96% is extreme. Then it goes on to say, we've already seen that Upstart is financially upright. Does Upstart have what it takes to pull through these challenges and continue executing? Of course, exclamation mark. You know, I think it's a little hard to say that it's priced for failure. It seems to me like it's priced like a loan portfolio that's not giving you enough data points to assess the risk of it. it said as of today, this thing is trading at 1.5 times book. And we've got one part piece of the business that is a cash drain against any kind of returns that are gonna be made off the loan portfolio. And let's say the loan portfolio has what they're calling a worst case scenario, but what I'm telling you is not the right way to do that risk analysis. So let's mark it down to 95 cents on the dollar. And 
But then again, we don't know yet whether or not all your AI is just paying a lot of people a lot of money or if it legitimately holds up better. But additionally, because they didn't really provide enough information on the types of loans, when I look at their loan loss number, it kind of looks like what some of the banks are showing me as their loan loss number and some of the credit card companies are showing me as their loan loss number. So I'm not getting a really good sense that you're writing a better book of business than everybody else. I need to actually see that because right now that's really the state of affairs for your company. Now add to all of that the fact that these guys still don't have easy access to the capital markets and essentially even if they don't experience the losses in the next quarter, this company becomes less and less a loan originator and more and more a loan asset manager. And that is not what this thing is supposed to be. That's not what this thing is funded to be. Now, just so it's clear, asset managers absolutely can trade at a discount to book value. Just have a look at Invesco ticker IVZ. It's trading at 75 cents of book value. And Goldman Sachs all last year traded under one times book value. So trading at 1.5 times book value, you're giving a lot of credit to all the technology that's been built. Is that right? Is that wrong? I won't know until the next quarter when I figure out what in the world this company actually is. Now, the momentum traders are going to do what it's going to do, and I'm going to try to figure out what I want to do relative to that dynamic that might be in the marketplace. But once we find out what's actually going on, my concern is this is more of a short than a long. Now, you definitely have a bunch of events with almost all of the banking sector coming out in the next two weeks before this company reports earnings. So it will be a wild ride and certainly one that the momentum investors will enjoy playing. That's all I have for this episode. If you want to see the original episode, it is located here. And here are some other uh, videos that I thought you might enjoy. It means a lot to me if you'd support me and watch some of those. Good luck in these markets.